if you think of Reconstruction and you think the, of the passage of those Reconstruction Constitution amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th, uh, which abolished slavery, gave black people civil rights and equality before the law, uh, and gave black men the right to vote. Each time those amendments were passed, but especially with the passage of the 13th and 15th amendments, you had black and white men and women celebrate joyously in the Capitol. Uh, they were there in the galleries when the 13th Amendment was passed. Uh, they, they, they celebrated in marches, in parades, uh, in D.C. and elsewhere. And that's when the federal government particularly, and the symbols of the federal government, became identified with the cause of Black rights and freedom. Um, and so white racists have always used an anti-government rhetoric, anti-big government. You hear that a lot. Now, states' rights is interesting because states' rights in the 1790s was, in fact, used to defend local democracy against uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts passed by the United States government to basically declare their opponents, their partisan opponents, as being seditious. And that was a gross violation of civil liberties. So states' rights, when it began, did not necessarily have that connection to slavery and to segregation. John Brown, Charles Sumner, and... Absolutely. So, of course, uh, let's begin with Charles Sumner. But what was astounding was during those uh, so riotous takeover of the, of the Capitol, you saw this uh, man from Delaware uh, carrying it was Delaware a slave state, but it didn't secede from the Union. It was still part of the Union. Uh, it was one of those border slave states that did not join the Confederacy, where this man is, uh, you know, walking around with a Confederate flag, and behind him was a portrait of Charles Sumner, the great abolitionist, who um, was actually beaten brutally. Uh, on the floor of Congress uh, by Preston Brooks, a South Carolinian congressman, uh, for his speech uh, against these pro-slavery mobs raiding Kansas all the time. And, and John Brown, when he was in Kansas giving slaveholders a taste of their own medicine, um, was enraged when he heard about the caning of Charles Sumner. Uh, it inspired him uh, to act in Kansas and it also would eventually inspire him uh, to launch uh, his war against slavery at Harpers Ferry in 1859. Uh, so Sumner was a, uh, was a very staunch abolitionist. Uh, during the war, he pushed Lincoln towards emancipation and black rights. Uh, and during Reconstruction, he really became a spokesman uh, for black people. Uh, they actually um, uh, saw him as their representative in Congress. Uh, so, you know, Sumner uh, is a, a very important figure in the history of a uh, black struggle, an important white ally. The conference is now connected. Hello? Hello? Uh, if we could just go over some of the numbers, I think it's, hello? Here. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. No. 11,780 votes that we need. No. 11,780 votes to win the election. No. Tell us, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break, please. No, sir. Dead people. No. Phony ballots. No. no women had men started screaming. No. Stacey Aaron. extraordinary men like Tunis Campbell and Aaron Bradley. These men were black abolitionists uh, and they came back to the South 
uh, and they won elections to the Reconstruction Constitutional Con Convention and to the state legislatures, along with uh, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner of the Amy Church. Uh, these three black men led Reconstruction in Georgia. They were the heroes of Georgia's Reconstruction. What's very interesting about Bradley and Campbell is that both Bradley and Campbell um, wanted land to be redistributed to freed people. That was seen as a radical position. Um, you know, it was supported only by the radical Republicans like Sumner, Stevens, and George Julian, and others. Uh, and these men fought at the grassroots in Georgia uh, to make Black freedom real. Um, so they were, they have been forgotten in history, and, and we really do need to remember them. So uh, the election of Reverend Raphael Warnock, uh, especially a man who pastors the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church of Dr. King, uh, I think is coming at the tail end of their legacies too of fighting for black rights uh, in Georgia. Uh, what's also interesting about Brad, uh, Bradley and Campbell was that they sounded the alarm uh, on the criminalization of blackness, the way Southerners were on trumped up or minor charges arresting black men uh, and putting them in this awful, worse than slavery, convict lease labor system. Campbell himself suffered through it for a couple of years, but Bradley uh, spoke out against the way the Metropolitan Police in Savannah was targeting black men uh, and arresting them. So they were really far-sighted. They were fighting for their rights uh, and for the rights of freed people in Georgia, but they also saw on the horizon uh, what Southerners were capable of doing in order to undermine uh, Black freedom. He was expelled from the Constitutional Convention and also from the state legislature before they expelled all the Black members. I think there were 27 of them uh, because he was so radical in his speech. You know, he... Other black legislators tried to moderate and tried to sort of use language that would appeal to whites, not Bradley. Uh, he was not having any of that nonsense. He was an abolitionist and he was going to use radical language and they were so offended by him. Uh, and even some of his uh, uh, black colleagues wanted him to calm down uh, because they felt that that would just provoke these whites more. But really it was just the presence of black office holders that drove the white racist nuts. Uh, they could have been as polite as Henry McNeil Turner, or they could have been as rude as Aaron Bradley. They all still got expelled. Uh, and, and, and Henry McNeil Turner's speech uh, on being expelled from the Georgia state legislature, along with all the black state legislators is important to remember. He says, you know, these people just want a monopoly of power. They, they don't want us as citizens. They don't want us as office holders. It's as plain and simple as that. And he had been really polite and compromising towards the whites, unlike Bradley. But even he realized in the end that, you know, uh, you can't appeal uh, to these races. So Warnock's election uh, and Ossoff, you know, because remember Georgia has a bad history of anti-Semitism with the lynching of Leo Frank, with the revived Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s that was anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant. Um, you know, those two elections were very historic. Uh, and I think uh, it shows that the Republican Party in still appealing to the same ugly threads of racism, anti-Semitism, uh, anti, you know, nativism, anti-immigrants uh, is it's 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 not it, that battle has been lost many times. But we should be wary. We need to defeat that over and over again, uh, because as we saw what happened on January six, uh, these people uh, are a determined racist minority, and they can always create trouble. The Washington D.C. right now looks like a, uh, a city under siege. Uh, the way probably that it did not look even during the Civil War. Uh, you will see pictures of National Guardsmen uh, sleeping on the marble floors of Congress. Uh, you will see them patrolling the city of Washington, D.C. And, you know, Washington, D.C., for a long time was identified with the Black middle class, with, with Black political power, because even after the fall of Reconstruction, you had a Black elite in, in Washington, D.C., a highly educated elite that was still holding federal offices. It was not until the first Southern Democrat elected to the presidency, Woodrow Wilson, 
uh, that uh, the black presence in the federal government took a serious hit. Uh, but the city was, was, as one author has recently put it, the chocolate city. Uh, it was a city of the black middle class, of black activists, of black, famous black suffragists like Mary Church Terrell. Um, so, you know, that city was attacked by these white mobs. Uh, they attacked our city and they attacked the capital of the United States. Those things are linked and it looks today like a country under siege uh, because there are so many threats uh, by these white uh, supremacist groups uh, against uh, Biden, Harris, since inauguration. You can imagine if President Obama drove them to a frenzy, how much seeing a black woman, uh, seeing uh, an immigrant woman, uh, a daughter of immigrants, uh, you know, reach that high office enrages them as well. And the mayor of DC, Muriel Bowser. Yeah, she uh, is a black woman and she uh, had actually asked for National Guard help. Uh, and the Department of Defense was, quote, still re reviewing her request. Uh, if they had acted on her recommendations, uh, then we would not have come to this. Uh, you know, they, they did not. Uh, the Metropolitan Police of Washington, D.C. was stretched thin, uh, and they had no backup until it was too late. Uh, and it was all dithering. Uh, by the Trump regime. I call them the regime, not administration, because it behaves like a regime, like a dictatorial regime above the rule of law. Mary Elizabeth Bowser, the spy and the Confederate. Right. And I just thought it was funny that her name was the same as Muriel Bowser. And I was wondering. Oh, yes. Right. That's all I was, maybe, I was, maybe somebody should do a genealogical check and, right. and ask Mayor Bowser herself whether uh, she was, uh, whether she is related. Because many times I will see some prominent African-Americans and their names, and it reminds me of some figure from the 19th century. And I always wonder, you know, are they related uh, to them? Uh, so it might be worth, uh, you know, uh, finding out uh, whether indeed it is. Some genealogists should do that. But if you look at the way that they have uh, attacked uh, our cities, whether it is Chicago, which is also led by, uh, you know, a, a black woman, Mary, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, or the mayor of Atlanta, they attacked our cities, they've attacked black voters in cities and said these votes are not legitimate. Uh, you know, they, they, they've done that for a long time. But I, I hats off to Ma uh, Mayor Bowser for for renaming the avenue and painting Black Lives Matter uh, right in front of the White House. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Uh, if we could just go over some of the numbers, I think it's, hello? Here. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. No. 11,780 votes that we need. No. 11,780 votes to win the election. No. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break, please. No, sir. Dead people. No. Phony ballots. No. The women had mass murdered screaming. No. Stacey Abrams, the internet, no minion machines. We did a campaign rally. 11,000. 780 votes to win the election and I need these votes and I don't care how long it takes me and there's no